Eichel, what does it mean to you as you look down the table and you look at the two generations that are a part of you and your role in the Japanese American community? Put some words to that for us. Well, I'm very proud of everybody here. First, uh, I must say that I did not become what is what the label I have now as an activist until <clears throat> after the camps when I lived in New York. We were so busy trying to reestablish our lives that and being afraid of Big Brother and trying to melt into the woodwork so that we wouldn't stand out as the, quote, former enemy. So I was too busy doing that and raising kids to really become more aware politically of the reasons what happened to us did happen. But I was fortunate enough to hook up with a very activist group, a forward, progressive thinking group of actually mostly Nisei women in New York. And uh, they opened up my mind as to trying to find the reason for the institutional racism in this country and what happened to us, uh, Japanese Americans, and why it happened. Uh, and this group, Asian Americans for Action, was made up uh, of primarily Nisei women. And it was a little different from the Asian movement that had begun here in the West Coast made up of very strong, what we call radical, young folks. It was a little different in New York City. And uh, I was greatly influenced to become a little more thoughtful about the reasons for our having been incarcerated in the camps. And this group opened up my mind uh, to become a little more aware I kept thinking that, and I'm not sure how true it is, but in my own family, the fact that my mother and father were not allowed to become citizens until 1952, they had no stake in the political picture in our country. So we didn't have the kind of conversation across the dinner table about who the mayor was, who we're gonna elect for the assembly in California, or who we, we we knew who the president was, but we were very apolitical and I was a product of that particular kind of family. I don't think all of the Japanese American families were like that, but ours was. And since my parents had no stake in, and couldn't vote, we didn't get into politics at all. And I grew up with that sense uh, of the persistent and pervasive racial discrimination back in the 20s and the 30s. So I, I carried that with me uh, even through the war and for a while after the war until I started becoming a uh, little more politically aware. And during that time when I finally started to think about these things, I heard for the first time uh, a young man from the West Coast who was a member of a progressive uh, thinking group who came to New York and heard him speak at the church, Japanese American Methodist Church in New York, and it's, it happened to be Warren Furutani. As Akemi said, this young man had fire in his belly. He spoke not just, uh, he spoke to me personally, even though there was a whole bunch of church people there. He said, wow, we never heard anybody like that, speaking like that right to me, almost street talk, but really relating to everybody in the, in the audience. So I said, boy, we we'll keep track of this guy. You know, maybe uh, he will help change people's minds and get them thinking like me. And uh, it was the beginning uh, of exchange between young folks on the East Coast and West Coast in the Asian movement. And then uh, we, the older uh, senior citizens like me and our group, we were grandmothers too already by that time, but it got us moving. And it was a very, very exciting time, exciting time for us. If I had not had this experience uh, of meeting this, uh, this bunch of women, including Kazu Ijima, her son, Chris and her husband, Tak Ijima, 
Men Matsuda, Metsisawada, Junkushino, Cheko Watanabe, Micho Kaku, all these people really affected my life. And then just about 1976, I think it was when Michi Wegland's book came out. I was still living in New York, uh, and her work uh, was very influential on my thinking. I got to know her in New York. We became very good, close friends. And when I moved down to the Washington, D.C. area, I still kept in touch with her because she was a wonderful guide to me for the research I decided to do. Well, since I had the luxury of living so close to the National Archives, I thought, gee, I'm so lucky to be here. All you folks who lived on the West Coast, you know, you just couldn't hop on a plane uh, so frequently to come look at your records or the history of why this happened to us and who was responsible. But here I was living so close to the archives and it was really a great opportunity for me to find out a lot of the information that we finally did get included in the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians report, which of course led to the payment of redress. And uh, I must say that Mrs. Wegman, Michi Wegman was tremendously helpful to me and, and the people who worked uh, with whom I worked were also very, very good cooperative. And I'm, I have to say that if it were not for some of the leaders uh, of the different movements and different projects that I had worked on, I think we would not have enjoyed the reward and recognition of the government wrongdoing uh, that actually happened. Now, Michael, let, let me interrupt you just for sure. a second. It sounds like your activism really took off after Lisa was already grown in many ways. Right? Yes. Oh, yeah. As a mother to your daughter, what, what was life like? What, 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 what kind of mother were you? What kind of daughter was she? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know we were going to get personal, huh, Lisa? <laughs> yeah, well. Because this is all pre activism. So, what, what kind of discussions did you have at home about what it meant to be Japanese American oh. and about? Uh, you know, politics and about what's right and what's wrong. Well, I think uh, we started to get interested when I finally opened, opened up my mind a little bit and Lisa and I used to sit uh, over the din dinner breakfast table and it was uh, anti-Vietnam War days. I think we talked a great deal about that and started talking about why our country was doing this and the fact that people of color seem to be the target of government wrongdoing as far as I was concerned. And so we started to do a lot, a lot of talking. And then I think Jer and Lisa also started to get involved with uh, uh, more political issues herself. She, I have to tell, let her talk about it. But uh, uh, somewhere along the way, she and Warren hooked up. Uh, okay, don't don't spoil that story because we're building the tension for that. <laughs> oh. <laughs>